Right Honorable the Prime Minister. Colleague. Colleagues. We meet here today to mark the visit to Canada of His Majesty King Hussein bin Talal of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and of his gracious wife, Queen Noor. Welcome, Your Majesties. We are honored to receive you. And in this house and in this country, you are among friends. We also celebrate here today the landmark first address to the Canadian Parliament of the leader of an Arab country. Your autobiography and the testimony of many respected world leaders record your dedication, sir, to the cause of peace in the Middle East. In fact, few, if any, have shown greater determination in this cause, nor pursued it with greater resolve. As Prime Minister Thatcher has said so aptly of you, Your Majesty, your human qualities, Above all, your courage and clear-sightedness have earned you both respect and admiration worldwide, and I can assure you, sir, that that admiration is shared by every member of this House and by all Canadians. Les Canadiens tiennent en haute estime et considèrent comme Canadians hold in high regard and genuine friendship those leaders in the region such as you, Your Majesty, who've had the great courage and profound wisdom to look beyond intractable conflict and seek a just and durable peace. We in this House know that you've taken great personal as well as political risks to bring an end to the Arab-Israeli conflict, and for this we salute you. Know that they are truly fortunate to live in a region of the world that has been spared the destruction of war for the time of our entire existence. But Canadians have served and suffered and sacrificed their lives in wars abroad. And they have seen the horrific consequences of war in the Middle East, where Canadians have participated in virtually every peacekeeping initiative since the UN's foundation. And it is for these reasons that Canadians want nothing more for your region, Your Majesty, than that all of its countries and all of its peoples live at last in justice, security, and peace. The successive Canadian governments have supported all constructive efforts to achieve a comprehensive negotiated settlement of the problems of the Middle East. Canada's support for Israel's right to exist and for its security is well known. It enables us to speak frankly to our Israeli friends as I did in the presence of President Herzog in this house in June when I said that Canada supports the concept of land for peace. But we believe that peace will not come if any of the parties is so threatened by the actions and statements of others that it feels it must give absolute priority to security over peace. Nous croyons que seul et... We believe that peace will only come on the basis of respect for the security, well-being, and legitimacy of all states in the region, and of respect for the rights of the Palestinian people. And those rights include their participation in the determination of their own future. Over the past year and a half, developments in the Middle East have altered long-standing assumptions about the nature of the peace process. Your own courageous and difficult decision last year, Your Majesty, to disengage from Jordan's historical links with the West Bank was a turning point in the peace process. ...when other leaders in the Middle East must make equally difficult but far-sighted decisions as you have, Your Majesty. The Israeli government's proposal for elections was, we believe, a significant initial step in a political process that could lead to a negotiated settlement. We are encouraged that President Mubarak has joined actively in the search for progress. His ten points have taken the peace process a step further. Canada stands ready to advance this process in whatever ways we can. 
comparable hope for a settlement in Lebanon, as you have mentioned last evening, have been overwhelmed repeatedly by violence and by hate. Canadians look on the heartbreaking situation there with grief and dismay. Quelle que soit leur allégeance politique, the members on all sides of this house are particularly touched by the anguish of Canadians with family and loved ones caught in the terrible cycle of civil war in Lebanon. Like you, we pray for a political settlement that reflects the aspirations for peace of all Lebanese and that will restore their country's national unity, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. We are encouraged by the efforts of the Arab League Tripartite Committee to establish a basis for national reconciliation and we hope for the sake of all the Lebanese people that this time, this time and finally, the ceasefire will lead to peace. To your especially strong and impressive leadership, Your Majesty, Canadians see in Jordan an island of stability and economic development. Jordan is a land of ancient civilization. Canada is yet a young country of modern history. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Canada and Jordan. But what brings us together is not only diplomatic association, but the prospect of ongoing friendship and constructive cooperation. The economic links between us are significant and growing. Petro-Canada International's technical assistance program to identify oil and gas reserves in your nation is a major case in point. But your visit here, Your Majesty, and that of your gracious Queen, allows us to strengthen our friendship and build our bilateral relationship and broaden the common ground we share in the search for peace. I am personally very much looking forward to continuing the excellent dialogue that we began in The Hague. And we, all Canadians, sir, are anxious to hear your views. And so colleagues of the House of Commons and the Senate, I present to you His Majesty King Hussein bin Talal of Jordan, whom I now proudly invite to address the Parliament and the people of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank His Excellency the Prime Minister for his kind introduction. It is indeed an honor, a privilege and a pleasure for me to visit Canada again and to address this joint session of the Houses of Parliament. Whatever the differences between our respective cultures may be, there is an important heritage which we have in common. The tradition of civilization, over 5,000 years old, going back to humanity's first urban settlements in the lands of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Palestine and Iraq. Today, the heartlands of our Arab world. In ancient times, our vast, beautiful, and spiritually evocative landscape inspired the birth and expansion of three of the world's most enduring religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. 
in medieval Islamic times, it was in the schools and libraries of our Arab cities that the great patrimony of classical knowledge was translated into Arabic, preserved, refined, and ultimately passed on to an emerging Europe to spark the first stirrings of the Renaissance. It was among the great Arab and Muslim centers of learning in Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, and Andalusia that medieval scholars, thinkers, and scientists expanded the frontiers of human knowledge in such fields as astronomy, mathematics, philosophy, ethics, medicine, and law. Today, of course, the tables are turned. And we find ourselves at civilization's receiving end. Also, we are saddled with a different reputation. The genesis of constructive pluralism, of which we were the original pioneers, is forgotten. And the conflict of contemporary nationalisms holds sway. Central to our present predicament is the need to reach a settlement over the question of Palestine. And it is to the particulars of this question that I shall address myself today. Rather than go into the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, I shall concentrate on the way in which matters stand right now. Since last year, the Palestinians and the Arab world have made a historic compromise to concede geography, but not quality, of national rights. The PLO has met all the prerequisites and requirements to achieve a peaceful settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. In line with international legitimacy and global consensus. The one remaining obstacle to a just peace is Israel's inability to reach a decision on the future of the Arab territories that it has occupied by force for over 20 years. At present, one half of the Israeli governing coalition favors a territorial compromise. The other half looks for ways to fulfill its avowed pledge to annex the territories, albeit in a camouflaged way to avoid regional and international repercussions. Unable to achieve more than the lowest common denominator of political consensus, the Israeli government tries to mire the peace process in debates over modalities and procedures in order to gain time and forestall the moment of decision. Hence the convoluted process inherent in the Israeli Prime Minister's plan for elections in the occupied territories. Palestinian representatives are needed to talk to the Israeli government about elections, which in turn are needed to select Palestinian representatives to talk to the Israeli government. To help break the impasse, President Hosni Mubarak of Egypt made his 10-point proposal on the issue of elections. It is not an alternative plan, nor is it a set of preconditions for dialogue. The peace plan, as approved by the Israeli government in May, called for Egypt's assistance, and the 10 points have come in the spirit of the proposed process. We believe that the Mubarak proposals constitute a helpful vehicle 
to advance the peace process. Ironically, we now see the Israeli Prime Minister trying to derail the very process which he claims as his own brainchild. These attempts to forestall the inevitable are futile. No matter how long and winding the road may be, no matter how many twists and turns it contains, it will ultimately lead to the question, does Israel accept the application of United Nations Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338 to the Arab territories that it now occupies, as they were applied to Sinai. There is only one resolution, 242, and it is ironic to see Israel accept its application to Sinai in its entirety and float a different interpretation of the same resolution where the West Bank is concerned. If Israel were to accept this principle, the modalities would not constitute a hurdle, and the road to the International Peace Conference would be open. As we strive to bring about a peaceful resolution of the Palestinian problem in all its aspects, a resolution that allows Palestinians to exercise their legitimate national rights and guarantees the security of all nations in the region. We are saddened to see Lebanon, once a haven for democracy, art and culture, come so close to being a den of inequity where our clothes find sanctuary and terror reigns. We find it encouraging that the plan of the Arab Tripartite Committee has been accepted, not only by all the Lebanese factions, but also by all Arab governments. We sincerely hope that the newly formed Lebanese Security Committee will continue to function, and that the Tripartite Committee will continue to receive the cooperation of all parties concerned. We thank God that the ceasefire is, at last, being observed. But it would not be sufficient to stop the bloodshed and silence the guns. Another area we are disappointed to see the truce failing to develop into a permanent peace is the Gulf. We are very keen to prevent the ceasefire between Iraq and Iran from becoming a lull, in which the two sides catch their breath in preparation for the next round. Each one of these conflicts, the Lebanese problem and the Gulf War, must be brought to a just, comprehensive and lasting peaceful settlement, and it is imperative for the world community to help in this pursuit. Lester Pearson articulated this imperative most eloquently when he said, aggression in any part of the world constitutes in the long run a threat to every other part. If it is true that we cannot tolerate a city of residential suburbs surrounding slums and degradation, it is equally true that we cannot be safe in a world community which condones lawless aggression in any part of it. These insightful words have grown even more permanent, pertinent with the passage of time. The rapid advances of communications, technology have increased the level of exposure and raised awareness of other cultures and ways of life, thus raising the hopes and expectations of the less fortunate to explore and take advantage of the new opportunities unfolding before them. 
This optimism has resulted in a higher level of maturity, best evidenced by the atmosphere at the 9th Non-Aligned Summit in September of this year. The voluble anti-imperialist rhetoric of the past had given way to more quiet analysis of common concerns like international debt, regional conflicts, and the environment, and the search for cooperation in facing these challenges. One of the points that received virtually universal emphasis in the conference was that differences of ideology should not prevent good relations and cooperation between nations. The pragmatic and constructive attitude, this pragmatic and constructive attitude cannot be taken for granted. It must be encouraged and nurtured because if it fails to bear fruit, if the underdeveloped world is not helped to make headway towards the cherished goals of development and progress, the resultant frustration and socio-economic ills would contribute actively to destabilizing the countries concerned and the regions. Nowhere is this more true than in the Middle East, especially since Israel has accumulated a nuclear arsenal and other weapons of mass destruction. There can be no global security in the absence of regional and national security and social stability. The opposite is equally true. Peace is the only path to the security and prosperity of any region, while conflict in any part of it turns the whole region into a time bomb that threatens world stability. Ladies and gentlemen, the world has become so interdependent and closely integrated that no nation has the resources to face the challenges of our time on its own. Without organized and comprehensive regional plans of cooperation, the various countries' attempts at development become random shots in the dark. This lesson was not wasted on the Middle East. We saw Europe begin to work towards political unity, having successfully achieved economic complementarity. We saw Canada enter a free trade agreement with the United States. And Jordan began to work for the establishment of the Arab Cooperation Council. Today, the Council comprises Egypt, Iraq, the Yemen Arab Republic, as well as Jordan, and remains open for the admission of other states who will be welcomed as constructive members in our community. All four countries have committed themselves to facing the social and economic challenges of the 21st century in a regionally coordinated effort to achieve comprehensive development. The success of this endeavor requires an atmosphere of political moderation and stability. When we look at the experience of Europe, we find that the political process that started with the European Coal and Steel Agreement created in a short while more concrete foundations for European security than centuries of defensive pacts and innumerable balances of power. It did so by creating a common interest in stability that turned the most implacable enemies into staunch allies. It is our faith that the security of all nations in the Middle East can only be achieved through a similar process.
This is the security that we seek to achieve. We pray to God to grant us success in this endeavor. Thank you. Your Majesties, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Premier Ministre, Honorable Mr. Prime Minister, Honorable Colleagues of the Senate and the House of Com Commons, Distinguished Guests, Colleagues in the Senate of Canada, I thank Your Majesty for the honor you have paid us in addressing this joint session of Parliament. This chamber no doubt reminds you of the British parliamentary traditions with which you are so familiar yourself. It is a very great pleasure for us to welcome Your Majesty and also Her Majesty Queen Noor among us today. Indeed, we consider it most appropriate that you should be the first Arab head of state to address this assembly. We know that when you acceded to the throne, you decided to be a modern sovereign of your people. We knew that we would be moved by the words of a monarch who during the 37 years of his reign has played a critical role in the unfolding drama in the Middle East and in the search for a lasting and just peace. Canada too has been actively involved in the search for a solution which would reconcile and do justice to the claims of the contending parties. For two decades, Your Majesty and Your Majesty's government have succeeded in maintaining peaceful relations with your neighbors so that Jordan is seen as a haven of peace and stability in a region subject to upheaval. And this achievement is in very large part due to Your Majesty's courage, realism, and abilities as a statesman. Canadians in all walks of life have admired Your Majesty's willingness to take personal and political risks in the interests of peace. We've admired the reasoned, moderate tone with which you intervene on the international scene. We are therefore extremely grateful to you and we thank you sincerely for sharing with us your preoccupations and your insights. I know your words have been eagerly listened to by all present. On behalf of the Senate, I would like to thank you for visiting us. We wish your majesty's happiness, peace and prosperity for your people and for the members of your family. Your Majesties, members of the House of Commons and Senate, honored and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my duty, but also my very great pleasure, on behalf of all members of Parliament 
from all parties represented here, Your Majesty, to say how much we appreciate your visit to our country and your presence in this historic chamber. And it is a very special pleasure to be able to welcome Her Gracious Majesty, Queen Noor, as guest of honor. Your presence here today culminates a long and important association between your country and Canada. Diplomatic relations were established between our countries in 1964. Since then, we have maintained contacts which we hope have done two things. Firstly, to bring us closer as nations who desire peace and progress for all the people of God's earth. And secondly, because of our association, we have created a relationship within which we have been able to discuss in very frank terms the Middle East situation and the concern and interest of all nations who hope for an end to hostilities and a just peace. The com Commercial relations, diplomatic exchanges, as well as important diplomatic and state visits have all contributed to the development of this friendship and will continue to do so. We in this place, who have paid attention to events in the Middle East, have no illusions. We are acutely aware of history, of tragedy, and heartbreak, and also of the absolute necessity to find a solution based on common sense, reality, justice, and compassion. We are also aware that all of us on Earth face a rapidly changing global environment. The public opinion research in this country is accurate. The great majority of Canadians believe that the man-made threat to our global environment is the greatest danger we face. If this is so, and many of us believe it is so, Surely our two countries can persuade others that whatever the provocation for conflict, there is now a terrible imperative to come together and save the world for all of us. Your Majesty, you spoke of this last night when you said, environmental dangers stop at no boundaries. And you went on to say that we must strive for cooperation rather than confrontation. And you said it must be within a spirit of reason and dialogue. These statements illustrate, we believe, your own wisdom. And we are heartened by your comments which indicate that despite all of the problems which you face, you can say to us what so desperately needs to be said. Cooperation rather than confrontation, reason and dialogue, and that our environmental dangers know no boundaries. Your Majesty. Your Majesty, you are most welcome here, and we hope to have the honor of receiving your visits in the future. We offer our sincerest wishes for peace and happiness to Your Majesty, your people, and your neighbors. Thank you, Your Majesty. Thank you, Your Majesty, for being with us today.
you've just seen and addressed and heard and addressed by King Hussein of Jordan to a joint meeting of members of the House of Commons in the Senate and other dignitaries in the Commons Chamber in Ottawa. That has now been concluded. Uh, there were uh, addresses of welcome by the Prime Minister and thank you by the speakers of the two houses, actually the Deputy Speaker of the Senate, Gil Mulgat, and the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Fraser. And uh, King Hussein is... Uh, on his way out of the chamber and will be leaving Canada shortly uh, to continue his trip. Uh, the Prime Minister, as a matter of fact, will be leaving also today for a two-week uh, tour of the Far East and uh, then back through Central America. Uh, so uh, neither of the principals who took part in this morning's uh, proceedings will be in the House of Commons uh, uh, this afternoon when the actual sitting of the House of Commons begins. Uh, the uh, session will resume at 2 o'clock this afternoon. And they'll go through member statements and the oral question period, and then they're going to debate this afternoon.